Hello everyone, welcome back to The Road to Nightfall. We are continuing with the beginnings of Tim Drake's tenure as Robin with the second arc. Or rather, the continuation of the first arc, because it really picks up right after the end of the last issue of Detective Comics. Except this time we are in Batman for issues 455 through 457. The creative team for this, these is the same as for the majority of the last arc. Writing by Alan Grant, pencils by Norm Brayfogle. Inks by Steve Mitchell, colors by Adrian Roy, letters by Todd Klein, and edited by the legendary Danny O'Neill. This arc ran from October to December of 1990. We open on a winter night in Gotham as Batman finishes a relatively peaceful nightly patrol, only for someone in the Skull Hood to shoot up a bus stop. Batman intervenes and stops the shooter, only discovered to surprise that the shooter was a old woman. Elsewhere, Reporter and off-again, on-again Batman love interest Vicky Vale is taking photographs for an article on Gotham's homeless population and chats with a group of homeless people before deciding to leave after being offered some roast rat. Shortly after her departure, however, another person wearing a skull hood attacks the camp with an axe. At the bus stop, Batman questions the shooter as she's wheeled into an ambulance. She boasts that she did pretty good shooting three people, considering this was her first time. When pressed by Batman for a motive, she says it was an old woman's whimsy. First, I want to say up front, the, this whole part of the plot feels very derivative of the movie God Told Me To, from the late director uh, Larry Cohen. Though oddly with actually more grounded reveal as to the cause of the killings, without getting too far ahead of ourselves. Also, second, having worked help desk before, I believe it with this character. I have had to deal with some utterly vicious and nasty old people when working help desks, so this kind of makes sense. Not saying that all old people are like this, but having encountered enough who were very vindictive and unpleasant, without getting into de too far into details. Meanwhile, Tim Drake is having a nightmare about his mother's death, with Batman and Nightwing lowering the casket into the grave as he reflects on the fact that basically every Robin to date has had dead parents. This leads to him to wake up with a start, and he can't really escape this bit because it's the day of his mother's funeral. Now at breakfast, the news has coverage of another masked man wearing a skull hood doing a mass shooting. Meanwhile, in Vicky's apartment, she's developing her photos from the night before and is apparently wearing nothing but a lab coat? Why? Why cheesecake up the scene? Particularly when, like, the very next few chunks of her storyline is her eating breakfast later. No one who takes their photography seriously, which Vicky would be, since it's part of her job as a reporter, since she doesn't have a dedicated um, Jimmy Olsen-style photographer, would develop photographs in the state of undress, because you're working with toxic and corrosive chemicals. Now, you'd have to be another klutz to spill them on yourself. But it's still the general safe practices. Also, as part of this, actually, Vicky would probably also be wearing gloves. Anyway, Vicky discovers that she caught the license plate of a car that may have dropped off the axe murderer and takes that to the police who dismiss that evidence. But let's slip that the car belonged to a Rico Marcuse. At the funeral for Janet Drake, Dick Grayson goes to Tim and lets him know that he's there if Tim needs someone to talk to. Dick then goes to Bruce and Asks him about Tim becoming Robin. Bruce says that Tim thinks he's ready. Bruce doesn't think that Tim's ready, though. That night, before going on patrol, Bruce explains his reasoning, reasoning for Tim. Being Robin is a symbol, and it's a, that means it's a lot of pressure, and that's pressure that Tim's not ready for, especially not yet. Tim disagrees. That night, Vicky stakes out Marcuse's office, only to be attacked by a hooded man with a sledgehammer as the issue ends. Issue 456 starts the story off with two parallel narratives, starting with Batman just a little bit before the end of last issue. Batman takes down a mall Santa who's wearing a skull hood and carrying nunchucks and trying to beat the crap out of people before being told by the police as they pick up the now unconscious and trussed up goon about Vicky Vale's lead, causing Batman to follow in pursuit. At Marcuse's office, Marcuse calls off his goon, the man with the hood was working for him, as opposed to just being a general rampaging murder, gu murder guy, 
and ushers Vicky into his car to head off to who he, Marcus, is working for. On arrival at the warehouse, Vicky makes a break for it and ends up running into the warehouse's office area, where she discovers the person behind all of this and is horrified by the revelation. During all this, Batman is in pursuit in the Batmobile. On arrival, Batman attempts to infiltrate the warehouse on his own, only to be confronted by a series of goons and booby traps, which ultimately incapacitating him, leaving him at the mercy of the Mastermind. And finally, during all of this in the Batcave, Tim has been looking at the evidence behind these killings, and what could be motivating these totally unrelated people to do these things. What could cause them to kill without fear of consequence? And at that, Tim puts it together. Batman isn't responding at the Batmobile, having already left to infiltrate the warehouse. As a desperation play, Tim calls Commissioner Gordon, telling him to send up the bat signal. But that's all Gordon can do, once Gordon himself realizes what's going on. Because with this opponent, Gordon needs all the men he can spare to contain this threat. So, Tim calls a cab, and hurries to the warehouse district, because there he knows that Batman is now at the mercy of... Scarecrow. Issue number 457 starts with Batman and Vicky Vale at the mercy of Scarecrow. Dr. Crane is quite happy to have Batman at his mercy, but less so Vale. He'd rather Marcus had taken care of her by on his own. So he gives Marcus his Christmas bonus and sends him away. Marcus's limo passes Tim Drake's cab as Drake hurries to the warehouse, and Marcus opens his bonus only to discover that his bonus is fear gas. Marcus panics, attacks his driver, and causes them to hurtle into pile into barrels of toxic waste, where they presumably die like that one guy from Robocop. You know the one. I I'm not going to post the clip here. Anyway, Tim arrives at the warehouse and makes his way inside, taking out goons along the way, some with subterfuge, some fighting more directly. Inside, Vicky and Batman are being tormented by Scarecrow using his various fear toxins. Uh, he's used a spider one on Batman already, and he's now he's ready to break out Eau de Trauma, which forces Batman to relive his parents' death. Tim breaks through and bursts into the room, only to get hit by the same toxin along with Vicky. Tim is confronted by his fears of the Obia Man, while Vicky is confronted by the time that she saw her puppy run over by a car when she was a child. With great effort, Tim powers through and with a swing of a pipe that he was using as an improvised staff, knocks Scarecrow into his cabinet of toxins, dousing him in a miasma of misery, knocking him out of action. Tim frees Batman and bails before the cops show up. At the Batmobile, Tim has collected his wits and also suspects that, yeah, he's not going to get be Robin for this. He violated Batman's orders to not go out. However, Tim suspected wrong. His actions saved Batman's life, and because of that, Tim has been granted to be the next Robin. As the issue ends, we see Tim in his new costume as Robin, a complete redesign from the costumes of Jason Todd and Dick Grayson before him. A new Robin for a new decade. This is a nice, succinct little chunk of the storyline. We get to see Tim going up against the much more heavy hitter of Batman's Rogues Gallery, a much bigger member with Scarecrow and taking him on both physically and as a detective. And speaking of which, the story does a great job of selling Scarecrow's threat as a villain. Scarecrow, he's not a physical opponent in the sense of if Batman or Robin are taking him on in direct fisticuffs, Batman or Robin are going to win. Um, but there are a threat in terms of their skill and cunning, and the nature of what Scarecrow's fear gas does makes him an intense opponent for Batman and Robin, because they take a psychological toll on the on whoever they're fighting against. Also, I am really glad that with Vicky Vale's trauma, one, it doesn't involve sexual assault. It's been gone at length by numerous other writers, the idea of having women as protagonists whose backstory involves sexual assault. Yes, lots of women are sexually assaulted, which is unfortunate, but that doesn't mean that you have to stick it into the backstory of all your narrative characters. Two, they had the 
taste to not show the audience what it was. We they described it. They told us what her trauma was. It involved her puppy as being run over by a driver when she was a child, but they had the sense not to show it, and I appreciate that. Now, next time, we finish off Tim Drake's origins as Robin as he flies by his own wings for the first time. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.